Welcome. Bitcoin is many things to many people. A new kind of money, an alternative to the internet, a way of changing the balance of power in society. They're all ideas that spring from Bitcoin technology. And my guest this week is as well placed as anyone to connect the dots between the technology and what you can do with it. I'd like to welcome the technical director of Enchain, Steve Shadows. Steve, welcome to CoinGeek Conversations. Thank you, Charles. Pleasure to be here. You're listening to CoinGeek Conversations with Charles Noah. Thanks for doing this. Um, let's start with one of the interesting new possibilities that you've been writing about, which is nano services. And let's start with the difficult part of that, which is the technical side of it. What has changed in Bitcoin to make this possible? And I think we are going to need to understand something, an intriguing thing called dust in order to uh, to answer that question. Is that right? Uh, yeah. And, and, and there's really nothing revolutionary about this at all. Uh, all it required was to remove some artificial restrictions that have been put in place uh, um, quite a few years ago. There was arguably a reason for putting them there. Uh, it was uh, intended, I suppose, to protect users from a potential mistake that they could uh, they, they could have made uh, if they were using well very poorly written software. Dust is just a, a, an amount of Bitcoin that is so small uh, that it would cost more in transactions uh, fees to uh, to spend it and make use of it on the Bitcoin network than the uh, the actual amount itself. So it effectively rec renders it. Uh, uh, economically unusable because uh, I imagine if it if it cost you two cents to make any transaction using cash uh, and you had uh, you had only one penny well uh, you'd probably never try to spend it it's the same concept with dust right and so you've overcome that by allowing people to sort of put little grains of dust together and it becomes in the miners' interest to accept a pile of dust. Yeah, it allows you to gather uh, lots of small bits of dust together uh, because these these pieces of dust uh, still exist in the Bitcoin network as data records that have to be maintained. And it's not really in anybody's interests for them to uh, to just sit around forever. Uh, to, to clean up that dust is a, is a net benefit to everybody. It's a tiny benefit, probably not the end of the world if you never did clean it up, but... Um, uh, it turns out that there is a way that you can clean it up uh, relatively cheaply uh, or almost for free and provide a net benefit for everybody involved. Right. So turning dust from something that is useless to something that you can actually work with has implications for future uses of Bitcoin. Yeah, I think uh, the idea behind uh, uh, collecting a whole lot of individual bits of dust and putting them together uh, to turn it into a, a more useful denomination of Bitcoin, I suppose, um, opens up the idea of a, a service provider uh, being able to charge so little for a service uh, that it falls into the realm of dust, but be able to actually like accumulate that value until they reach a point where they've got enough of it to collect together. Uh, and turn it into into meaningful value, and this this means that um, uh, you can actually charge even less for services on Bitcoin than than even um, than even I, I had ever assumed uh, was was feasible. So that opens up a world of possibilities, and and it's it's almost a new class. We talk about Bitcoin as enabling microtransactions. And when people talk about microtransactions, they're typically uh, thinking in terms of a few cents or even fractions of a cent. This is below the threshold that is feasible with traditional uh, payment mechanisms where you know anything below probably a dollar uh, is pointless because of the, the fees that would, would eat up most of that value. But nano payments go beyond that into a whole new class below, uh, a threshold below which I think many people have thought that even Bitcoin couldn't go. Right. So... If I have an idea of something that could be done that people would only pay the minutest amount of money for, it's still worth doing because if there are enough transactions like that, it's potentially got a, a business model that would work. People have been speculating that this might relate to little bits of data that are being sent across the Internet of Things. Do you think is that the kind of thing you've got in mind? 
Yeah, that's an entirely feasible use case. There's, uh, you know, micro computation, for example. Um, even something as simple as validating a, a, a Bitcoin signature. Um, it's a it's a piece of work that's just, that's so small. It costs a few CPU cycles. It's it's a it's a non-zero cost, but it's too small to imagine ever paying somebody to do it uh, for you on a on a one-off basis. But um, if, for example, Bitcoin signature validation is a service that you're interested in, being able to pay pay for it on a on a per instance basis opens up the possibility of uh, of being able to um, uh, create markets for this sort of thing, real time markets where, uh, where where I can I can take the the lowest bid for for validating my signature or whatever micro computation uh, I might uh, might want on a on an instance by instance basis. So we've had a sort of ecosystem of app developers and startups based on micropayments. Do you think there's going to be another whole collection who, of people, entrepreneurs, who get ideas that they can uh, use nano payments for? Uh, I certainly think it's possible. I think what's important about this is that the possibility has been opened up again on Bitcoin. It, it was always there fundamentally. It's just that there were some software implementation barriers to it. Um, but it's not for me, I think, to uh, to figure out what these these business models are, or if there even are any. Now that uh, I, I suppose this this model has been demonstrated, um, uh, it's going to be up to to other creative minds to uh, work out how that maps onto a business model. But I, I can think of a few myself um, that are very fundamentally to do with how Bitcoin works in the back end and the and the infrastructure kind of required to um, uh, to to make Bitcoin work. Um, so that's enough to convince me that there is a use case, which suggests to me that there's probably plenty of other models out there that I haven't thought of. Yeah, well, you've been describing um, ways of making peer-to-peer -peer payments that would incorporate these nano payments, I think. Yeah, and the idea, I think, is that you piggyback off the fact that there is an existing transaction already happening, um, which, uh, which already covers transaction fees. And if there are other people involved in that transaction that can um, that can improve the the transaction experience, uh, then you can uh, add on additional payments to to other people in in the same transaction. So a transaction may not be paying just one person; you might be paying five or six people. For example, I mean, people often talk about the idea of of uh, paying uh, sales tax, GST, VAT, uh, whatever it's called in in your country of choice. Uh, along with a payment. But uh, what if it's a micropayment and what if your VAT is actually a, a, a dust amount? Um, then that suddenly becomes a, a bit more complex and difficult. But with a nano payment, you could do it. When we talked a year ago about the future of Bitcoin, there was one phrase that you used, which was that you thought that it was going to put the power of economic sovereignty into the hands of people who currently don't have it. Um, my question about that is that it seems to me increasingly over this year that the kind of applications that are being talked about are ones that plug into big organizations. They're not somebody with their laptop coming up with a great idea, but they're big infrastructure projects. Do you think that the sort of balance has changed between the vision of, of what Bitcoin can do over this past year? Well, these are all visions that I think are being uh put forward and created by people who are using Bitcoin. Um, I don't think there's any reason why all of these different emphases can't be made by different parties at the same time. Um, I'm interested in enterprise use cases uh, because I think that that has a lot of potential to demonstrate some of the scaling power of Bitcoin and the, uh, the demonstration of the scalability of Bitcoin, I think, is probably one of the important parts that will drive the adoption of Bitcoin at the more uh, individual level uh, as well. Um, so there are people working in all of these different areas. Uh, I don't think that emphasis has necessarily shifted because no one dictates the, the emphasis of Bitcoin. Uh, it's just a tool that can be used in, in so many different ways. Right. I saw an interview with Craig Wright recently in which he talked about not being as dismissive as he once was uh, about the importance of marketing and communication in, in business, I suppose. I imagine in a lot of tech companies, people in those sort of softer areas are not necessarily at the top of the pecking order. I mean, do you agree with Craig that there is a crucial role for 
perhaps I could call it public education about the work of Enchain and the work of, of Bitcoin? Or is superior technology going to win through in, in the end anyway? It doesn't matter how superior a technology is if people don't understand what it is and what it can do for them. Uh, technology is only useful if people use it. So um, I would have to say, yes, I do agree. Engineers are not that great at explaining technology uh, to end users because engineers tend to use very technical language. Um, marketers, of course, uh, may not be primarily technical in their background, so they might have a bit of a struggle trying to understand what the how a thing works and and what the use is it uh is it uh, uh to them uh but if they can't understand that then they can't explain it to anybody else there is a a really uh important role there to play i think uh in in helping people understand why bitcoin actually should matter to them and it may not necessarily mean talking about bitcoin uh to them it, it may mean presenting them with some user application that can do a thing for them that uh, that they previously didn't have a way to do bitcoin wins by solving problems uh and uh, that is a proposition that is completely ununique to bitcoin it's a proposition that is uh, is true of almost any uh any technology solution so within that would you say it's more important to try to win over more informed and technical people who work in other parts of the cryptocurrency business? Or should the message be directed to the general public, to people who really know nothing about anything at this stage? I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, and um, I wouldn't care to take a guess at what the right balance should be. Uh, there, there are a lot of um, technical skills and abilities out there that are oriented toward uh, um, uh, non-Bitcoin cryptocurrencies, which I think we could make uh, great use of in the Bitcoin SV world if some of those people understood Bitcoin SV better. Um, but on the flip side, uh, the way you're going to attract the, the interest of some of those people is for them to actually see users using Bitcoin. Um, so I think it's a, it needs to be a balance. Uh, it needs to be a mixture. Um, and it's all of these things happening together that will gradually sort of build the groundswell of support and use of, of Bitcoin that, you know, just compounds and builds upon itself. I certainly try to spend some of my time talking to people outside of the Bitcoin space, but who are more on the, on the technical end, I suppose, that do have some background in, um, in the cryptocurrency world. In terms of two cryptocurrencies, I wouldn't say that Bitcoin SV and Ethereum are, are best of friends, but they're not actually people. Uh, I've sat and had uh, conversations with some quite senior people in the, uh, in the world of uh, Ethereum, and they tend to start with skepticism, but uh, they soon realize that we're actually real people uh, working on Bitcoin SV and that we kind of do know what we're talking about. So um, those conversations are, are worthwhile having. Uh, also, when we talked last time, you, you said that your, your eventual sort of aim was to work yourself out of a job because uh, this was pre-Genesis, because everything would be sorted out, set in stone, and you could go home. But there doesn't seem to be any shortage of, of work for you to do, and you're, there's more and more stuff being produced by N-Chain. Um, is there any end in sight? Are, are you going to sort of finish the job one day still, do you think? I have a secret succession plan in mind, which I can't talk about, but uh, the job doesn't stop with the, with the, the locking down of, of the protocol. Um, once the protocol is locked down, then it's actually time to start using the protocol uh, and making use of it to build things on top of it. So, you know, there's a certain um, uh, collection of work that needs to be done at, at, at that level or that I, I would personally like to... to help get done at that level because uh, it's part of demonstrating um, you know, how Bitcoin can be used and how Bitcoin can be useful. Um, dealing with protocol wars and all of that sort of stuff was a distraction that no one needed for the first 10 years of Bitcoin uh, that stopped people from actually working out how to use it and use it uh, effectively. Um, so yeah, we've got most of that behind us now uh, and this is a really exciting time and we are building things in Enchain that are commercial. Um, etc. Uh, we don't talk about them a lot outside of Enchain because we kind of want to get to a, a stage of completion before we do. Um, but what you see, I guess, from Enchain on the infrastructure side of things is 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 just uh, tip of the iceberg. Mm. Right. I mean, you spent so much time thinking about all this. You must have come up with some absolutely amazing business ideas, I imagine. I hope so. The market will tell. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to see them one day? 
Certainly, yes. Yeah, we're working on a lot of that right now. And not all of them come uh, come from me. There's a lot of uh, fantastic minds inside of uh, uh, Enchain. Will that be, will that be, uh, will that be Enchain Productions or Steve Shatter's Inc.? <laughs> Um, yeah, and chain productions. Uh, uh, well, that, that's for the marketing people to figure out, I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're at the the Coin Geek Live conference, and um, it, it seems a lot longer than six months since the conference in February in, in London, and everything has changed in the in the world as 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 well as major progress for Bitcoin. Um, how would you sum up the development? since February in, in, at the conference in London? What, what, what have been the highlights of what's changed and what's improved, do you think? Look, it's been a really interesting six months because it has necessarily changed the way that a lot of people work, uh, including myself. Um, I think for engineers, uh, being in lockdown is probably a lot easier for, uh, for them than it is for people in a lot of other professions because engineers tend to be quite happy if they're told they have to stay in a room and, and code for, for days on end without human contact. Uh, <laughs> I'm one of those people that falls into that category. Um, so a lot of people in Enchain have, have kind of thrived. Um, we, we did miss uh, the interactivity, I suppose, of an office being able to sort of stand around a whiteboard and nut out a problem. Um, but it didn't take us long to find tools that enabled us to kind of do that in an online world. So it has been a really kind of productive uh, time, um, but it's been a very kind of heads down behind closed doors. Let's just, you know, use this time to get stuff done. And I, th I think that's been happening around a whole lot of the, uh, the, the, the Bitcoin ecosystem um, because a lot of people have kind of gone quiet, but um, we're starting to see them uh, emerge from the chrysalis, so to speak, uh, and a whole lot of new things are, are coming out. And it's becoming very apparent that this last six months has not been uh, a quiet period. Uh, it's just been a, a less noisy period because people have been busy building. Has it made you think, um, I don't know why I spent so many hours and days flying around the world talking to people when I could have sat at home and done it. <laughs> yes, uh, that thought certainly crosses my mind. I mean, sometimes it crosses my mind when I am flying around the world, but uh, I guess it's balance. Uh, there, there's always a shift, uh, shift in emphasis for, for different, different periods of time. There's a lot of value in doing that, walking, you know, flying around the world, etc. cetera. But, uh, but from time to time, you've just got to stop and say, okay, I need to spend some time at home. Sometimes I even uh, uh, stop and say, I'm, I'm actually going to not have any internal meetings for a week or two uh, so that I can sit down and focus. And a lot of our uh, people at Enchain uh, kind of go through phases and cycles like that. Um, but yeah, there's a time for getting out there and talking. There's a time for staying home and, and, and knuckling down. Uh, I think now, because we've had this period of intense building, there's actually going to be a lot of stuff for people to get out and start to talk about again. Is Enchain still getting bigger? And has it been possible for you to hire the, the kind of technical expertise that you need? Uh, it has. Well, I mean, um, we completed the acquisition of Crea earlier this year, which is a, a, a huge boost for us. Uh, Slovenia is an incredible source of engineering talent. Um, and we've been working with Crea for, for a couple of years. Uh, we've certainly continued with the, um, uh, the recruitment. Um, it's a little bit different uh, how you go about doing it when you're, uh, when you're in this sort of lockdown uh, kind of world. But there are still, you know, there's plenty of good quality people out there. And uh, what we're finding is um, we're using them faster than, than we can hire them. You always feel like when you hire someone new, it's uh, going to take a little bit of the pressure off, but um, we, we, we seem to f uh, fill up backlogs faster than we can hire people to, uh, um, to, to take care of them. I mean, every time we get together for a conference, and I've been to about three or four now, I think, there seems to be more momentum and more projects underway and more developments. But somehow we haven't reached sort of the top of the mountain yet in terms of proving that this has immediate economic value in a big way. W would you agree with that or am I being not optimistic enough? Um, I think there's there's certainly more work to do in terms of uh, being able to prove it. Uh, part of that is bringing on board some, some real enterprise uh, use cases, uh, which 
um, it, it, it takes time. Uh, and of course, it's not the, the only uh, thing that needs to happen. Um, I'm personally inter interested in enterprise use cases because they're um, uh, potentially a big kind of Kickstarter. And once Bitcoin actually starts to demonstrate a scale in the in the production network, uh, which requires you know large volumes of, of transactions uh, being generated, that's when it's going to get uh, taken notice of uh, by, by by the outside world. Because we know what we can do uh, in terms of uh, scale uh, with the scaling testnet, etc. Um, you know, we've pretty much won the argument about uh, whether or not Bitcoin can scale uh, by, by going down the big block path uh, because we actually did it. Um, you, can't, uh, you can't argue with the fact that we actually did it. But once it becomes the norm every day for a continuous series of 50, 100, 500 megabyte blocks uh, being mined, that puts us so far uh, apart from every other blockchain um, that has uh, you know fundamental kind of scaling issues once we've shown uh, that we are doing this um, uh, we can do it and and it's happening on a, on an ongoing basis um, the world that is interested in blockchain will have no choice but to start paying attention to to what we're doing uh, and that on its own um, helps to you know kind of create that compounding effect where more interest brings more use well, I think you can feel very satisfied with yourself as a person who's made dust useful anyway. That's an achievement in itself. <laughs> but uh, Steve, thank you so much for, for doing the podcast today. No problem. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much to Steve Shadows for doing that interview behind the scenes at the recent CoinGeek conference. Please join me next week for my conversation with another conference participant, the journalist Eileen Brown. Amongst other things, she talks about why she thinks she gets trolled so badly whenever she writes about BSV. See you next week, I hope. Thanks for listening and goodbye.